Hi, I'm Alton Power. I'm a professor of molecular virology here in the Wellcome Wilson Institute for Experimental Medicine in Queen's University, Belfast. So virology is the study of viruses. Viruses are the most numerous form of life on the planet Earth. There are more different types of viruses on the planet than there are of all other living organisms combined. It's that diverse. It's a huge, virome is a huge, huge uh, area of research and a, hu a huge area of interest in terms of the biology of Earth in general. A virologist like me studies human uh, viruses. In particular, I'm interested in respiratory viruses that cause disease in the lungs, like bronchiolitis, pneumonia, etc. And the kind of viruses that I work with are respiratory syncytial virus uh, and for the last year or so SARS-CoV-2, which is the agent that causes um, COVID-19 disease. Virology in Queens has been studied for many, many years, starting way back in the 1950s. We had, in fact, Professor George Dick, who was the person responsible for discovering Zika virus, which was a major, major virus concern around the time, for example, of the 2016 Olympics in Brazil, and why a lot of people, for example, didn't travel to Brazil because of the Zika virus outbreak there. Since then, uh, since Professor Dick, we've had Sam Mar Professor Sam Martin, Professor Kenny Fraser, all of whom were internationally renowned experts studying measles virus. And after them, we had Professor Bert Rima, who was also then a major uh, internationally renowned scientist and researcher in uh, studying measles virus, uh, the biology of measles virus, and also about the vaccines associated with measles virus. And in the last uh, while, like the 1990s or so, we had Professor Louise Cosby, who's now actually the director of uh, um, virology in AFB, but was here for many years and did an awful lot of work with both human viruses and um, veterinary viruses. So uh, for in the last year, obviously, we've been preoccupied by SARS-CoV-2 because of this huge pandemic that's had a major, major um, impact on life throughout the globe. Every single country in the world has been affected by this pandemic. Here in Queens, we are also doing significant research on this virus. On the one hand, we have Dr. Connor Bamford, who's looking at the biology of the virus, its genome, and how it into, how it, what the structure of the virus is and how it actually behaves when it infects cells. I'm really interested in how viruses interact with our immune system, and I'm really interested in these proteins that our, um, our immune system and our bodies actually make, and they're called interferons, and these interferons, they interfere with virus infection, and they actually block viruses getting inside our cells. Um, and we really want to know um, how we can harness this um, interferon technology, this natural antiviral technology that our bodies make, um, how we can harvest that, harness that um, to actually make um, new treatments, new therapies and protect ourselves against viruses. We also have Dr. Lindsay Broadbent. I'm a virologist and I specialise in studying the host response to virus infection and that basically means that I infect different cells with viruses and then look to see what happens, what the immune response is, do the cells die, are they damaged and my, my speciality is working with a type of cell model called primary cells and these are cells that are taken directly from people and we grow these cells into what I like to call mini lung cultures and these are cells that are grown in dishes but they actually start to look like the cells that we have inside our lungs so they start to produce mucus and they have hairs on them and it means that we can actually replicate what happens when a person gets infected with a virus in real life. And then my group then is looking at drugs so if we understand what the virus is made up of and how it replicates and we understand how it causes disease, we can begin to identify drugs that will treat COVID-19 disease and hopefully have a big impact on people that do fall sick, preventing them from dying or not staying so long in the hospital, for example. So there are many different types of viruses, as I stated, that we work with here in Queens. And to deal with that, we have different safety levels that, uh, that are in the laboratories. And biosafety level one are for working with viruses that do not cause any problems for humans at all, so that we don't have to have any major control or concerns with them. 
BioLift Safety Level 2 are viruses that cause a fairly innocuous disease in humans. For example, a lot of my work for the last many, many years and the work of my group is working with respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, which causes severe disease in very young kids and the elderly, but not so much in normal, healthy adults. So this is why we work with this in what's called BioSafety Level 2 uh, containment uh, conditions. As you, we all know, SARS-CoV-2 actually does cause a lot of damage, particularly in elderly people, but not only elderly people. And we, have, uh, we are required to work with that virus in what we call biosafety level three con containment conditions. And these are specialized laboratories that allow us to make sure that when we're working with it, it never gets out of those laboratories. But we also have to gown up with very specific uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, that protects us from uh, being infected with this virus. So this is biosafety level three. And then we have one level of safety above that, which we don't have the capacity to deal with here in Northern Ireland. It's called biosafety level four. And these are really the worst of the worst viruses. For example, like Ebola virus, which cause tremendous amount of death uh, in individuals that are infected. Like there's the, the case fatality rate for Ebola virus could be over 50% and maybe even up as high as 90%. So we need very, very strict containment facilities and biosafety level four to be able to work with this virus. So the research that we've been involved with here is trying to, first of all, understand the virus itself. Secondly, trying to understand how the virus interacts with human tissues. And the importance for that is related to the pathogenesis, the disease that the virus caused, which is COVID-19. A major part of the manifestation of the disease is that the virus gets into the airways, it infects the airways tissues, starts replicating, and this causes the immune system to respond in an inflammatory response. And the inflammation that happens is a major part of the disease pathogenesis. So the, if you get a lot, of, a tremendous amount of inflammation, the people end up getting very, very sick. But if you don't get so much inflammation, then the, 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 the disease is what we call asymptomatic, really, is what, what we have at the moment. So we know the spectrum of disease is from asymptomatic, no symptoms whatsoever, even though you are infected, all the way through to death. Our goal then with this research is to try and find drugs, on the one hand, that can stop the virus from either getting into the cells and replicating or actually replicating in the cells. So we're looking for antivirals, okay, these, these block the virus. The second part we're looking for, which we think is equally and, may, and uh, important to put together, is the anti-inflammatory drugs. So therefore the drugs that block the inflammation response following infection. As I say, this is coming from the immune system and an awful lot of the damage that's done is caused by this inflammatory response. Our goal then is to use drug, what we call drug libraries, which are FDA approved. And the main reason why we're interested in FDA approved drugs is because these drugs have already been tested for under other indications. They're all, many of them are already on the market or they're in clinical trials. And that means we can turn them around or repurpose them for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 much, much quicker than we could if we were to design brand new drugs against SARS-CoV-2. So we're talking about designing and generating drugs or screening drugs in a very short period of time, like 12 months, 18 months, as opposed to years, seven, eight, nine years, to be able to, to develop a drug to treat a virus. And we're doing that then, as I say, we're doing high, what we call high throughput screening, where we're combining many drugs together in together to stop to see if the virus is, uh, we can block the virus replication on the one hand. And if we can do that, then later on, we will separate those drugs out to see if any of them can work either alone or in combination. And overall, we will have over 2000 drugs we'll be screening. And with the combinations we have, we're looking at over 500,000 combinations of drugs to be able to find one, all going well, that actually works against the virus and blocking the, blocking the virus and stop the replication. And similarly with the inflammation then, we're screening these drugs to see when the virus gets in and it releases, the body releases all of these chemicals or proteins that cause inflammation. We want to see, can we stop that process? So not the virus itself directly, but the inflammatory response. 
And we and many other people throughout the world are, are convinced that if we block both the virus and the inflammatory response, we will have drugs that actually make a huge difference in uh, the ability to be able to treat the virus uh, and the disease associated with the virus. This is evident from the drugs that have already been identified to treat uh, COVID-19. One was dexamethasone, which is a, an immunosuppressive drug. It suppresses down the inflammatory response. And just in the last week, there were two antibodies uh, that can bind to receptor for what we call interleukin-6. And these, this is part of the inflammatory response. And these combined are now able to treat and prevent upwards on 25 to 30 percent of patients who are very very severely ill from dying so they're able to save quite a lot of lives just by virtue of the the, um, the the research that's been done in the last year so our goal is to add to those drugs and art add to the armaments that we have to treat the the virus and the disease associated with the virus our goal with this is to get the drugs into the clinic as quickly as possible to do our best uh, to help treat in the, in the fight against uh, COVID-19. We are aware, however, that these viruses constantly evolve. So even SARS-CoV-2, it's likely that we might have new variants in the next year or two years that we will need to think seriously about being able to develop new therapies for them and vaccines as the case may be. But also, there are a whole bunch of other viruses out there that are just waiting to jump into the human population, again, that could cause similar type of pandemics like we saw before. So I think the this is an opportune time now to think seriously about the investment we have in biomedical research going forward and to make sure that we have in place the capacities to be able to deal with uh, these kind of pandemics in the future in a very, very rapid manner so that we can treat fine therapies and fine vaccines against these viruses as quickly as possible.